esteemed colleagues of the FACTI panel, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first and foremost thank uh, all of you for joining online at uh, this consultation held in this difficult and unprecedented situation the world is currently facing. On, on behalf of the panel, I wish you, your families and your friends and colleagues continued health and safety. I would also wish to thank the Secretariat for organizing this event despite these challenging circumstances. Uh, this panel, as you know, is a joint initiative officially launched on 2nd March 2020 by the Presidents of the General Assembly and the Economic and Social Council with a view to enhancing the financing for the Sustainable Development Goals. Mobilizing sufficient resources and particularly domestic resources for implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is, as you all know, a major challenge. And there is no doubt that this challenge will be exacerbated by the current economic downturn and financial turmoil due to the COVID-19 pandemic. When we hear the figures of the IMF, it's 30% uh, of the world production that might be uh, jeopardized. However, we are convinced that uh, the only way forward is to remain committed to global cooperation between governments, private sector, civil society in support of sustainable development. In fact, the work of this panel is especially important now as many countries are facing dramatic economic slowdowns and associated decreases in public uh, revenue. Uh, just to give an example of my country, Niger, uh, public revenue might be reduced by 40%. Uh, this reduction in revenue is arriving just as governments are faced with the need to bolster public health systems. And uh, we know that social protection systems, which were already stretched thin in many countries, are facing heightened pressure from increased unemployment. Effective public revenue generation is of critical importance to financing the kind of public services and health systems that are better able to weather COVID-19 and other future shocks while supporting progress on the sustainable development goals. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a panel's fourth virtual consultation, virtual consultation. And the second one with experts. This consultation addresses the panel's cluster of work on improving cooperation in tax matters. Let me briefly update you on highlights of the panel's work since the launch. Despite uh, restrictions on international travel and meetings, the panel has already begun its substantive work. On 31st March, the full panel held its first video conference with all members attending. The panel has reviewed the background paper prepared by the Secretariat, which is available on the panel's website. The paper provides an overview of existing international frameworks related to financial integrity, analysis of cross-cutting issues, and recommendations of topics for possible future consideration by the panel. On that occasion, the panel agreed to split up further work into three clusters. Cluster one is on improving cooperation in tax matters. Cluster two is on accountability, public reporting and anti-corruption measures. And cluster three is on cooperation and settling disputes. The cluster leads were also agreed. 
The panel then started to engage with stakeholders. We met with member states on 24 April, with civil society on 28 April, and with anti-corruption experts on 30 April. We will continue as a panel with an open and transparent approach, indeed, for the panel to make actionable recommendations, we need to engage regularly with all stakeholders. The panel is likely to complete its full interim report in September and its final report in February 2021. The panel has convened this experts consultation as we want to hear what are your views regarding the priority actions for promoting accountability and transparency and enhancing the global fight against corruption? All your inputs will feed into the interim report of the panel. And I thank you warmly in advance for your contributions. Please note that uh, this meeting will be recorded and posted online in the next few days. At uh, this time, I would like to pass the floor to Jose Antonio Campo, Facti Panel Cluster Coordinator, who will provide us with an overview of the approach of this cluster. Uh, please, Mr. Ocampo, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Co-Chair, um, distinguished members of the uh, panel, uh, and uh, uh, all colleagues uh, uh, attending the meeting today. Uh, let me uh, start by underscoring uh, uh, two points, one that the Co-Chair already mentioned, which is the, uh, the effects uh, that this crisis will have on fiscal issues, which uh, uh, will make the uh, uh, this topic uh, particularly important, uh, given the uh, strength and role that the states are uh, assuming during this crisis, uh, as well, of course, as the fact that the uh, the Addis Ababa uh, agenda uh, already uh, put uh, the issue of taxes and tax cooperation uh, at the center uh, of the global financing for uh, for development agenda. In the world, we have today three. Uh, uh, cooperation processes associated to, uh, to the topic we're going to talk about. The first one uh, uh, is the role of OECD, which uh, uh, was uh, 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 asked by the, uh, by the G20 to, uh, to assume the coordination of the uh, uh, base erosion of profit shifting process, and uh, the, which led then to the creation of the inclusive uh, uh, finance, uh, uh, inclusive the tax network, uh, 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 which uh, uh, is already working on on the uh, th second issue, which is digital taxation. Uh, OECD also launched a process of exchange of information among tax authorities that has been going on uh, for some time uh, more. The second is the uh, the the United Nations Tax Committee. Uh, uh, which is an expert body uh, of ECOSOC. It has been upgraded twice, uh, uh, the first time in 2004, and then uh, uh, during the uh, uh, Addis Abeba uh, process in 2015. Uh, although the uh, uh, one major proposal uh, by developing countries, the group of 77, uh, to make it a, an intergovernmental organ rather than an expert committee uh, was not approved. Uh, in Addis Ababa and remains uh, a, 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 let's say a pending uh, topic in the agenda. Uh, and the third is the, the very good work that the IMF does to, to the, uh, uh, through the uh, in Department of on, on Fiscal Issues, uh, uh, which uh, uh, has provided some of the best analysis uh, on the topics of the uh, international dimensions uh, of, of taxation. Uh, 
these three processes, uh, I think, uh, will have to be analyzed um, uh, by us and, and take uh, and make recommendations. Uh, on the on issues, uh, let me uh, uh, perhaps uh, underscore five, but there are probably more than five uh, that you will probably bring into the uh, uh, meeting today. Uh, the first one uh, is the uh, the need for universal uh, legal instruments uh, that will uh, you know strengthen the uh, uh, tax cooperation, uh, as well as the universal participation uh, in these discussions. Uh, uh, and how to arrange it uh, through these uh, uh, three different cooperation processes or new ones uh, that, yeah, that uh, we could think about. The second topic, uh, which is the you know central to the current discussions on digital taxation, uh, is the issue of allocation of taxing rights uh, in a, in a world in which many uh, uh, services, in particular, are provided cross border. Uh, and some uh, uh, firms that are providing them do not have a physical presence uh, in the place where they are providing uh, their services. Uh, this issue, uh, which started uh, uh, with a focus on, on, on the digital firms, uh, has a broader scope, as is widely recognized today, uh, because there are many, many firms uh, uh, selling their uh, services cross border uh, through digital means. Uh, the third one is the issue of tax avoidance and, and evasion, which was the center of the base erosion and profit shifting uh, process and, and which uh, no doubt uh, has further dimensions uh, that have to be uh, discussed. Uh, the fourth is the, the, need, the need for reliable global data uh, uh, that can be used by tax authorities uh, and can be exchanged across among tax authorities in order to uh, uh, to manage the uh, the two former issues, the, uh, the allocation of tax and rights, uh, and how to uh, try to control tax avoidance and evasion. Uh, and the th fifth one is is the institutional framework, uh, which has to do with the uh, the three uh, cooperation processes, how they coordinate each other, uh, what are the responsibilities that they assume, uh, and how uh, we want to uh, this uh, institutional framework to move forward. Let me finally say that um, uh, the topics that we are going to discuss today uh, in this cluster uh, do have a lot of interaction with uh, topics in other clusters. Uh, let me uh, mention the uh, the one that we already discussed, which is corruption, because uh, uh, in a sense there the could be a link between tax evasion and corruption. Uh, the second uh, is the issue of a global asset registry, uh, which is a topic that uh, uh, Process all the uh, clusters that we're going to analyze. Uh, the fourth, uh, it has to do with the asset re recovery um, uh, for uh, in cases of the, you know, tax evasion. Uh, and finally, uh, the issues of dispute settlement, uh, which are important uh, uh, for taxation and, and, and I must say are highly underdeveloped uh, and with a lot of discussion of wh whether uh, national authority, uh, what is the role of national tax authorities uh, and, and national judicial processes uh, in any uh, in this area, in the area of taxation. Uh, with this, uh, Koshera, I think I have presented the major topics uh, for the discussion today, but I look forward to, to hear from all the participants. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ocampo. So before we proceed uh, with the interventions, uh, let me ask you all to mute your microphones to avoid background noise and to keep the interventions clear. Uh, if you would like to take the floor, please use the raise hand button in the Zoom app so the secretary can keep track of your request. Also, in case you lose sound or video, try refreshing the browser window or try to log out and reconnect to the meeting via the link which was sent by the Secretariat. Uh, finally, I, I want to stress that this is meant as an interactive session amongst experts. Uh, please then keep interventions 
concise to allow time for the large number of participants to speak. And please uh, do not read long pre-written statements or country positions. The panel has opened a call for written submissions and we welcome all written submissions. So we request that you make use of this to submit material in writing. Now we can get uh, started. We have the first few interventions already set and then we will open, we'll move to an open dialogue. So if I'm correct, uh, Peter, uh, we can start with Ms. Kim Jacinto Henares from the Albright Stonebridge Group. So please, Ms. Henares, you have the floor. Uh, good evening, Manila time to all of you. And I don't know whether it's morning, afternoon to the rest. Uh, I actually, before, when I was invited, I looked at the the materials and basically uh, in the materials it said um, there are several avenues that the panel is supposed to deal with. First, promoting on accountability in the context where it is currently lacking. Well, I think the, the thing that's lacking is really, um, I think there are a lot of uh, people monitoring tax authority. You know, there's a FATF, there's OECD, Global Forum, there's a whole range of people. But uh, I noticed that the way things are implemented, it is not strictly in implemented. You know? It would slide, right? So you tell the tax authority and the government you should have transparency. So all of you should lift bank secrecy law or all of you should put tax evasion as part of, uh, of the FATF, you know, the money laundering measure. But when you get you evaluate the country, it slides. It does, it, the application is not consistent. So I think the first and foremost is that when we use the present mechanism, we should be consistent in applying the rules and we should not slide just because depending on what, the, what country it is or what the situation is no? because otherwise nobody will pay attention to all the rules that have been set then there are other things like fostering universal participation in international legal instrument on tax matter the thing to to be able to foster universal participation is i think from day one everyone should have equal voice and equal vote to whatever it is that we will agree upon. It cannot be like what happened in the Global Forum, basically, especially in the, a, in the EOI and the base erosion profit shifting mechanism, where uh, the developing country was not really part of the decision-making process. And now that it, the first the identification of the problem was not correct because the identification of the problem was based on what the developed country think the problem is. But actually, if you look at all these tax problems, it's really a concern of the developing country. So for people to expect that, they, that everyone will agree to a certain thing, I think the very minimum is that they should be asked what the problem is and they should be asked what their proposed solution is and at the end of the day, they should be able to vote for or against the solution. Of course, I don't think it should be the expectation of everyone that there should be a unanimous decision. I think that's what's uh, making the whole thing so difficult is that uh, there is a statement that there should be a unanimous decision, but there's a unanimous decision for people who can vote. And then after that, you are imposing it on all in every on every other country who had not voted on that solution. Maybe it should be better that they participated and they voted, and then we just go with a majority position whether which one will be carried and which one will not. And I think the thing there is, to me, I think the United Nations should be the one to lead the discussion because there 
the everyone is represented. No, I don't think it should be. I don't think it is correct that UN abdicated their their power to the OECD. Because I was also a member of the UN Tax Committee of Experts, and when we go into discussion, basically there's an abdication of the decision-making power. Because always I hear the discussion that that was adopted by OECD, therefore we should adopt it. So I think that kind of mentality should be uh, modified. You know, because uh, when you're in UN, you're representing not the developed country, but you're uh, representing everyone, the developed and the developing country. Then the third is better aligning taxation with location of real economic activity. I think the problem here is that um, we should break down what the concern is about digital economy. Because if the digital, the digital economy, as it relates to hard goods, which are goods that has physical appearances and that has to cross the custom border, I think the concern is less. Because when it cross the custom border, you are collecting that, right? So you cannot circumvent it. Whereas if you're talking about the soft goods, then I think there, there, there should be a consensus on how, or a discussion on how uh, income or taxation should be done. So there, were, there are proposals of apportionment of income and taxation. I think that's a simple way of uh, dealing with it rather than doing the transfer pricing because transfer pricing is a very difficult, a difficult process to undertake. And most of the time, uh, the one who wins are the developed country and not the developing country. Because the developing countries, us administration, people does not really understand it and does not have all the mechanism that will allow them to make the right decision. And the other thing is the improving tracking of asset ownership and use of this information. I think there is also a proposal for a global registry. I think there should be an agreement what, whether a global registry should be undertaken and what are the assets that should be in the global registry and how it should be registered and what are the details that should be in the global registry. I think there should be a discussion about that. And if you have a global registry, basically you, you not only deal with taxation, you solve a little bit of the taxation problem, but you also help in minimizing corruption and also helping in uh, recovering of stolen assets or those, sub, or those that are uh, the instrument or the result of corruption. So, uh, so it will, so it will hit several birds with one stone. And then preparing consistent and reliable global data on taxation. I think in this situation, we should all agree first on what are the data that we need, what are the data that we should collect, how should it appear, so, or the details of that data. Uh, because if we're clear about that, then all the tax administration uh, in different country would gear how they collect uh, data in such a manner or uh, tax policy people will know what is it that they will require or what how the law should be written to be able to collect all these things but until there's clarity on what it is that is really needed then uh, then it's very difficult to come up with the global data. But the first thing that should be done is agreeing on what these are and how it should appear and, uh, and the detail of the global data. Uh, and I think there should be no cut off uh, amount like what's been happening in the uh, BEPS where there's a cut off amount of 500 million pesos. So basically it does not really help the uh, smaller the developing country you know, because uh, it, it does not cover the whole gamut of uh, data that's needed for taxation. So improving international cooperation, cooperation on asset recovery and return. Actually this should be dealt with in a way that everyone should agree 
in a legal instrument that that is what they are bound to do. Uh, it should not be left to the whim of a government whether they will agree to it or not. There should be a legal instrument that basically everyone should sign up on. And, and the question about carrot and stick so that people will, will follow is that my suggestion is since UN covers World Bank, IMF, and other aid agency, the other, the carrot will be, the stick will be, if you don't follow all these things, then we should not give you any aid because you're not helping yourself. Or if you're a developed country, if you don't follow this, we will impose additional charges against you. So your donation or your membership fee should be increased. That's just a suggestion. I don't know whether that's feasible or not. Then improving co corporate cooperation and standardization of bribery investigation and prosecution. Uh, I think the most important thing in this, in this plan is that we should have uniformly banned bank secrecy law globally. Well, because if we don't have bank secrecy law, then it would be easier to be able to determine whether and to catch these people who are committing corrupt practices no? and be able to prosecute them. Because uh, the thing there is to follow the money, right? So uh, there should be a consensus and a, a stick that says that all of you should all countries should remove bank secrecy law, especially if you cannot do it for everyone in the government, at least those data should be transparent to the tax administrator, to the depart, to the prosecutor, to the central bank, and to the anti-money laundering council. So that's my suggestion. And examining options to strengthen peer review process. I think if if it's in a legal instrument, then automatically we should have a peer review process because otherwise you cannot monitor and evaluate whether it is being followed or not. Or we can uh, leverage off what the OECD is doing with the AEOI you know, because they, whether we liked it or not, they were able to impose the EOI obligation to everyone, whether we liked it or not, because we were... Uh, the countries were, say, were told that they would be put in the gray list or in the black list and they would not be able to move money around. So we can leverage on that thing. So basically that's my suggestion for coming up. And the other suggestion I have is I think the United Nations should decide to convert the UN Committee of Tax Experts to be an intergovernmental uh, body so that it becomes more effective and my suggestion is that everyone should decide whether uh, because the, the developed country seems to be seem to have a split personality when they're with OECD and they're arguing about arbitration they disregard sovereignty issue but when they're discussing the UN tax committee being an intergovernmental agency, they talk about sovereignty issue. I mean, they should decide which is which. They cannot have the sovereignty agreement in one side and the sovereign, not the sovereignty agreement, the sovereignty argument on the other side. So that's basically my input on the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Anaris. And we, we especially appreciate you participating, uh, despite the very late hour in, uh, in the Philippines. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, second, um, we have on our list Mr. Logan Ward, the Executive Director of the African Tax Administration Forum. So, Mr. Lord, you, you have a floor. Good evening, thank you very much. Uh, good to see everybody and for ADA, uh, it's an honor to be part of this conversation. International cooperation is important now more than ever. 
we know and your, your panel would have heard from previous conversations with others, as you said, Mr. Co-Chair, um, that a lot of the issues would have been part of other discussions as well. So mine would be really to focus on the importance of the international legal instrument uh, for developing countries and in our case for African countries in particular. So we would have seen the importance of international cooperation if you look at the illicit financial flows that we've been focusing on on the continent. Our focus, our attempted focus on high net worth individuals and the flow of money illicitly uh, into lower no tax jurisdictions and particularly avoidance, tax avoidance um, through um, transfer, transfer pricing and other multinational behaviors and therefore the importance of instruments such as uh, the exchange of information. But to have uh, these instruments and to deal with these illicit financial flows and, and, to, and to deal with the rules that causes avoidance such as transfer pricing and others, there has to be rules. Question is, who makes those rules? And in whose favor are those rules essentially made? It is acutely so now with the whole question on the taxation of the digital economy. Here on, on the African continent, the members of ATA have particularly raised the fear of the immense losses arising out of this, this process. And uh, as, as we all know that this is currently coordinated through the inclusive framework and the OECD secretariat is doing its best in terms of generating a broader inclusivity. I think the inclusive framework has about 130 members in there. But if you look at the issues, it will, it will illustrate for me the fragility of the current form of, of uh, international cooperation and the weaknesses within those instruments. What has been our experience? Our experience has been that in the end, as you said, Mr. Chairman, the, the issue around the digital economy is it's essentially an issue of taxing rights. And so if you look at the unified approach and the two pillars without going into any detail, under pillar one, absolute deal breaker, the mandatory arbitrary, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, mandatory binding arbitration. I think Kim referred to that briefly at the end. And how uh, developed countries are kind of insisting on this, especially the US and the amount of risk that poses to developing countries. It seems not to be off the table. Um, and then of course, in the pillar two environment, there's a very technical issue around minimum tax. Now, if you actually unpack all of this, it is not going to disincentivize multinationals to engage into, in BEPs in African countries or developing countries in general. So who's gonna make these rules is the question. So if you look at those as examples of a multilateral engagement, you then say what happens to these discussions? So our understanding of the inclusive framework process is that number one, the haste and the date has to do with the G20 agenda. How many of the 130 odd countries are members of the G20? Who is going to make the policy and the political decision in terms of the final outcome of all of this? And so, yes, you have, you have raised two other platforms, so the UN Tax Committee and the IMF. Uh, other people have said that those platforms are, are really not where it's happening. It's happening at the OECD, it's happening at the inclusive framework. That's where the technical work is done, that's where the research is done, and that's where the institutions are coming. Similarly, if you look at the BEPS process, I think one can generally agree that BEPS didn't work. Um, but what we did in Africa is we tried to use out of that process what we thought was important. And part of that was to deal with the transfer pricing rules the interest deductibility rules, developing guidelines for African countries. The extractive industry wasn't part of the BEPS agenda, but we made it part of our agenda. As a result of that and working with partners and even and, and part of our own programs, we can boast the 1.1 billion US dollar assessment over the past four years arising out of those things. But a lot of this was taking our own program 
out of that BEPS process because there were things that were not really high on the agenda of developing countries, uh, certainly not African countries, like country by country reporting and other things. The last part of the, of the cooperation that is interesting is although the minimum standards within the BEPS framework was, or, or joining it was optional, you found 13 African countries being blacklisted by the EU in a very arbitrary fashion, threatened with sanctions if they didn't join and meet the minimum standards within a certain period. It wasn't part of the deal, so who makes these rules and these standards? And so it is important in the world of international cooperation, and especially now with the digital economy debate, to try and understand who sets the standards, where are these standards set, and what happens in the process of the standard setting. Maybe just to explain, Africa has four countries on the Bureau of the Inclusive Framework. The, we recently had to put, a, put in a complaint because the issues that developing countries in general and African countries in particular have been raising have not been considered. Not, this is not an OECD or a secretariat issue. This is the developed countries that are focusing on issues only in their interest and ignoring the issues of other countries. And what has been it? It's been the trade war between the US and Europe, or it has been the transfer pricing issues they have with China and India. Everybody else, collateral damage. And so that is part of the issue. One needs to find probably a, an international legal instrument that's gonna deal with these important issues of uh, domestic resource mobilization, avoidance, and evasion, information, data transparency, all of this in a neutral and fair way. Maybe just to, come to, to, to quickly talk about uh, the political part. For Africa and I, I think a lot of the other developing countries, the representation happens through tax administration. Tax administrations are not the policy making. And there's quite a gap between the political and policy process in Africa and with others involved in these negotiations at these platforms. And so there's, there's an, almost an absence of a political or a policy process, a gap, and that poses huge risks for us in Africa. And so a platform where all of this can be brought together in a far more substantive way is what is needed. I will try and respond to other issues later, but I'll stop here for now, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ward, and thank you for insisting on the dimension of inclusivity. Um, now I would like to turn to Ms. Alison Christians, who is at the McGill University. Uh, please, Ms. Christians, you have a floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just want to make sure everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So um, thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to participate. Um, as many people on the call know, I've been a frequent critic of the way we do global tax policy today, and I'm happy to give more detailed remarks or you can read my papers, but in the interest of ensuring there's time for everyone to engage in discussion, let me draw a very succinct picture of what I think the world looks like if we do better at global tax governance. Uh, I'm gonna focus on three areas, ones that have already been touched on representativeness, transparency, and sustainability. What does a representative global tax governance structure look like? A representative global tax structure looks like one where extractive industries is at the center of this discussion and not left in a subcommittee in a body that doesn't have intergovernmental agency status. A representative body would have studied formulary apportionment with the same intensity and attention as non-routine profits attributable to marketing intangibles. Until we have a representative uh, global tax governance body, we won't be studying those things uh, until it's representative. Those things will continue to be pushed out of the main conversation in order to make room for what matters to the 37 members of the OECD. The second uh, being transparency. 
if we have a transparent global tax governance system, outside experts would be able to review and replicate OECD economic studies. And to do that, that means we have to have procedural structures to allow researchers to access data that currently is sitting in the coffers at the OECD. In a normal government, you have procedures to allow research to get at confidential tax data. A transparent global tax governance structure has to have that same feature. Without it, we're in the dark. Outside researchers will not stop asking what's going on inside of the process. They will be forced to keep asking those questions and they won't get satisfactory answers. And that feeds back into the governance representativeness point that we will never be satisfied with a governance structure that doesn't actually show how it is that different countries are supposed to be participating when they're not involved in mandating, they're involved in implementing. And then finally, and remember I said I would keep it short and I really will, uh, is sustainability. A global tax governance structure that's sustainable would um, be sure that there was interdisciplinary study of the value added by externalized costs. I'm mainly talking about the externalized costs of chewing up human labor and using up planetary resources and not fixing those costs into the way we consider how value is added today. A global tax governance structure that focused on sustainability would make those questions front and center. There would be real linkages with the UN's uh, project on the Agenda 2030, and they wouldn't be just trying to make those links after the fact. A global tax governance structure that's truly inclusive, representative, transparent, and sustainable would have to make sure that the platform for collaboration on tax was itself representative, transparent, and sustainable. It's not clear what the platform for collaboration on tax is really for right now or how it works. So I think until all of those answer, uh, questions are answered, we're gonna still be looking to figure out what does a global tax governance structure even look like? We don't even really know what we're working with on the outside. And with that, I'll leave it to the other participants on the call. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Christians, and thank you for highlighting this free concept of uh, uh, transparency, representativeness, and uh, and uh, sustainability, which are anyway uh, very closely linked, in order to set the foundations for a for a much uh, more efficient uh, uh, global uh, governance uh, tax governance system. So uh, I would like now to. Uh, Turn for our final intervention to Ms. Irma Mosquera Valderrama uh, from Leiden University. Uh, Ms. Mosquera, you have a floor. Thank you so much. Is everyone hearing me okay? Yes. Yes. Great. So, just following up on some global governance and being the lead researcher for a project, specifically called Global Tax Governance, that Alison knows about it. And when we look at the implementation of BEPS and what are the differences in the implementation of BEPS in 12 countries, what we have seen right now is that we were moving from between developed and developing countries, and we were moving from a change of information to BEPS, and now we have the COVID-19. And what we see right now is that countries, and especially the tax administrations, either they have the resources to, and the knowledge and the capacity and the personnel to raise this revenue that is needed, or you need the technical assistance. Normally, when you need the technical assistance, you go to the platform for collaboration on tax. But the COVID-19 has also created another problem. You have cash flow problems, you need to stimulate the business, and at the same time, you need to make sure that the economy keeps going in general. So the question is, now the developing countries are looking towards the IMF and looking for emergency reliefs and also a eight, project, eight uh, programs to try to find out then what we can do right now, what, how we can is have this debt relief, how we can have this economy emergency. So instead of saying we go back and say now the countries can fund themselves, what we are saying now, let's go back again and ask for aid. And that's a problem. And the problem is because developing countries will have also, of course, I think that there are some people from the IMF participate and perhaps in this call, 
and the IMF will also have of the international organizations will have their own conditions to give that money or to give that relief. So it's not only about BEPS and commitment towards the implementation of the four minimum standards with a peer review, but at the same time, it's also, it's also about how we are going to meet these requirements from aid right now. One of the things that is also important, and this is my second point, is whether the countries are now developing these programs that call for fiscal stimulus, where they look at, for instance, the OECD has an overview and presented yesterday are very well overview, so as the IMF has also an overview on what measures are being taken now with COVID-19. When we look at this fiscal stimulus, we are looking at tax measures and for instance we are looking at tax exemptions, we are looking at a, a relief of losses, we are looking at tax deferrals. This is the moment where the transparency and accountability can be key and key for this fiscal stimulus and key for these incentives. So I know some people also, I mean Christian and Agustin Redonda have been working on tax expenditure but also what is important is to look how we establish these incentives. What is going to happen right now? If the economy needs to recover and we are introducing these new tax measures for COVID-19, how we are going to, uh, how long? First of all, and are we going to have a pre, during, post evaluation of these incentives? Because right now, as it was noted yesterday from the OECD, there is no clarity which measures are countries taking, which is the best measure, but also no clarity is going to go out to his so of course country may say right now i take it out for it's for two months but you never know this is so much uncertainty you don't know so we need some transparency and accountability and start thinking about the tax incentives that the countries are introducing at this moment and they were also introducing before and also focusing on a gap on a pre-post during evaluation of the incentives um this is kind of similar to also looking at whether we are only looking at tax incentives from business or employees, but also, for instance, gender equality. So there is a lot of discussion right now saying about women are working at home and having the children or whatever is it, or women are unemployed or whatever. So this is also important. So we cannot forget these uh, needs. And my final point has to do with the peer review. Because normally with the peer review from the OECD, you have a recommendation you may follow or not but most of them follow that but one of the things that could be important is to find out how this peer review could help to learn it a contextualization and to try to help the countries to exchange best practices if you are working on this what do i can do so there is of course some south to south projects uh, but at the same time there is more need for this learning and contextualization in the peer reviews process at the same time as a change in best practices. And I think that this is a nice forum to, and a very appropriate forum to be able to discuss these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mosquera. And uh, thanks to you all for your interventions. Uh, and uh, for the very good points which were raised. So now let me uh, open the floor to the FACTI panelists to respond. And uh, I will start with Mr. Ocampo. Would you like to go first, Mr. Ocampo? No, Mr. Chair, I think we, uh, uh, I mean, I, I talk about most of these issues in my introduction. So, so let's give the floor to other members or uh, to other participants. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll give the floor to other to other panelists. Um, so Peter, who would you have on the list? Uh, I didn't have any indication from any of the panelists, okay. but uh, I okay. I did I note see that Mr. Karim Daher. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Daher, and I also note that Miss um, Ogutu said she had to leave, so she might want to make an intervention before she leaves. Okay, perfect. So let us start then. I can make an intervention before I leave. I have a lecture that starts at six o'clock. Um, um, I think, uh, thank you so much for um, the comments that we've received from ATAF, from uh, Ms. Vascara, and from 
uh, Alison very, very um, instructive uh, interventions that you've made. And I think one of the things that uh, really stands up for me is the issue of the global governance of uh, the international cooperation in tax matters that is of ultimate concern here. And I think this is something that especially Logan has really tries to raise. Because it's not only the OECD, although that's where the technical issues are taking place, it's not only the OECD that is working on these matters, but like um, as the last speaker mentioned, we have uh, the platform on global collaboration on tax that is really moving and concentrating on the toolkits. These are matters that are actually not put at the forefront in the BIPs or the OECD uh, discussions, but they have been relegated to toolkits to deal with issues that developing countries uh, matter to them in terms of um, in terms of what is really important for them when it comes to BIPs issues. And I think that shines a, a big light when it comes to the lack of inclusivity and transparency in that issues that really are of concern to the broader developed countries are not brought to the fore, but are really relegated to such platforms such as this. And of course, we welcome um, the, the, the funding and the, and the technical assistance that is given. But these matters, like the rest of the speakers have said, should be brought to the forefront. So we have the platform on collaboration on tax, and then we have the EU that is causing um, um, consternation to developing countries like Logan has said, we can't have a situation where the OECD creates the rules, so to speak, of um, what standards should be complied with by the inclusive framework. And then you have another body that creates sanctions for those that are not involved. Where does the OEU sit in all this? So we see um, this um, breakdown of who is actually pulling the shots when it comes to the governance of global issues. I've talked about the EU, I've talked about the platform for collaboration, the IMF is another body, and of course the UN. UN has brought up issues pertaining to the, uh, the taxation of services in its UN model, and these things have been relegated, relegated and not discussed in the platform. Uh, but they are actually important for developing countries. So if we have a situation where different bodies are pushing for what really concerns their interests and all these issues are not brought together in one organization that deals with everything at a go, then we actually don't have cooperation that is taking place. And that is the root of the whole issue that we are actually trying to deal with. Before we can start dealing with the issues, the issue is who is actually pulling the shots? What are the standards that we should use? And how do we comply with them? As it is right now, we are all over the show. We are not so sure who sets the rules, what are the standards, which issues are important to who. And as long as we are in that type of situation, it's quite a problem to get international cooperation. Very sorry, I have to leave four minutes. I have to get into my lecture. Wish you all the best with the rest of the deliberations. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arendt. Thank you. So, uh, Peter, we have uh, on our list. Uh, so I see Mr. Daher, and as well, uh, I saw that Mr. Kadar wanted to take the floor. Okay. And, and then we should go back to the, to the participants. To leave also. Thank okay, you. so we have a floor. Thank you, Co-Chair. Thank you, Panel. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, what I would like to say is that by, uh, what I have noticed from the previous uh, three session, and I still notice in uh, out of this session, is that we have two tier countries. We have, on the one hand, uh, the developed countries that are suffering from an uh, unlawful competition. Uh, because uh, all the flows are, uh, all the investment are taking place in uh, countries uh, where there are tax advantages. Uh, and on the other hand, we have other countries also suffering, the developing countries and the uh, low income countries suffering from the same situation because uh, actually uh, they are suffering from uh, from uh, the fact that the wealth or the income 
uh, not benefiting to the citizens uh, because of the corruption, because of the fact that all the revenues are derived and are flowing outside uh, through the PEPs and uh, through other corrupted, uh, corrupted uh, people. That's why uh, I have identified uh, actually uh, uh, three, uh, three or four main issues from all the discussions. And uh, the first one uh, is the fact that we have to uh, address uh, the, stack, uh, the tax challenges of the digitalization. We haven't talked uh, today or speak about the digitalization because the digitalization is affecting uh, the low income countries and the developing countries. And this is one of the main issues that should be tackled and should be, uh, we should find solution out of the cooperation, the cooperation between the countries and uh, we have to address uh, seriously, and we have al uh, already addressed this issue in the previous sessions. The second one is that we need a new nexus and uh, profit allocation rules uh, within the general framework of the international cooperation. Uh, it means uh, where actually uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the tax should be uh, levied and where the tax should be paid, where the activity is generating revenues or where the companies uh, are residing or in both countries. I know that this issue has already been addressed by the OECD within the uh, BEPS, uh, the BEPS uh, general framework, but uh, I think that on uh, the, uh, the United Nations and uh, for, for more globalization between the countries, this issue should be, uh, should be uh, addressed uh, very seriously uh, concerning uh, many other, uh, many other uh, issues that are uh, related to this issue, like uh, the fact that we will have country by country uh, tax return or declaration of revenues. Uh, the third uh, the third one is how to trace uh, UBOs and how to trace PEPs through the cooperation and through adapted tools. And we have noticed that in several, uh, 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 several presentations, uh, we have uh, the, the fact that we have addressed the global uh, land registry, the global land registry has been requested by uh, many persons uh, by many, uh, by many uh, present in many presentation uh, in the previous uh, sessions, and um, uh, we have to address also the weakness in the uh, applied measures, because we know that uh, even in the uh, in the OECD. Uh, in the OECD standards, uh, uh, whether in the CRS or in the BEPS or other uh, means, we are noticing that we have many gaps and mismatches uh, in, the, in the rules that have been applied. And uh, the loopholes uh, uh, are, uh, have been noticed because we have several countries that are outside uh, the member countries. And those countries, are still applying are still applying uh, different rules that are uh, considered as being uh, very uh, uh, that are affecting uh, the good implementation of all the measures that have been applied. Uh, this is what uh, I have identified out of all the presentations, and I think that. Uh, those issues uh, should be uh, tackled uh, in our uh, forthcoming uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Daher. Um, Peter, who do we have on? I had Mr. Kardar still, and then uh, uh, Ms. Ovangio Dida, and I'm mindful that we're very late, so I'm going to ask everybody to be very brief. Yes, please, please. Mr. Kardar. I'll be very brief. It's a, it's a big... It's a simple question to those who are referring to digital tax. In the case of goods, as very rightly pointed out, we actually collect customs duties. So why can't there be just be a consumption tax on services instead of thinking in terms of a turnover tax, which the EU has been thinking? And the chances of that going through, it appears to me to be fairly slim. So aren't we better off just having a consumption tax on services? so that at least 
uh, developing countries don't lose out on revenues. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for the proposition, Mr. Kardar. So, question proposition. So, and then we have Irene. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to all the participants. Just two questions. Uh, one is we will be receiving written submissions, and I will invite um, participants if, if they can also speak to the issue of coherence in existing mechanisms, how to achieve coherence in existing mechanisms for tax cooperation. And, and secondly, a question that I, I would like to hear spoken to even today, the, the issue of regulation of multinational enterprises vis-a-vis uh, -vis universal tax rules and vis-a-vis uh, national sovereignty over tax matters. Um, that was briefly touched on, I think, by the, the first speaker, Kim, uh, but I would be interested to hear from other participants what is their proposals around how uh, the issue of uh, sovereignty and regulation of multinational enterprises can be achieved in tax matters. Um, thank you very much for these two points, which might be uh, uh, responded by some of the participants. So, who do we have now as panelists uh, who would like to take the floor before we go to the open discussion? I haven't seen any chair, so I okay, think we can good. move. Okay, so I think we can move to the open discussions. Please uh, do keep your interventions uh, brief uh, so that we can allow the many interested participants uh, to intervene and have a sound interactive uh, dialogue and the panel members might come back and, and, uh, and respond. But before we proceed, I would like to make a couple of suggestions for the smooth operation of this uh, uh, discussion. If you would like to take the floor, please indicate so during uh, using the, uh, the raise hand button. And of course, uh, please try to remember to unmute yourself when you are ready uh, to speak. And please submit, uh, avoid submitting long statements. And if you have these statements, sometimes state, long statements are necessary, uh, please uh, provide them by email. So I, I encourage you to keep your interventions uh, brief. So at this point, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Peter Shola uh, to call on the participants. Mm. Thank you, co-chair, um, and thank you, Dr. Maki. So uh, I'm mindful that we are already over the allotted time, but I, with everybody's indulgence, we'll go a bit longer, but I would really request that um, people be brief when they make an intervention. Uh, I'm gonna try and do this in a fairly gender balanced manner, uh, which means that some people will maybe not get to speak, um, and I will try and uh, pick up on those who um, haven't spoken yet in any of our consultations. Um, so I have uh, first on my list, uh, Wilson Pritchard. Wilson, can you give a, give a go? Yeah, uh, great. Thanks very much, Peter. And thanks everyone for uh, indulging me for a couple of minutes. I will indeed try to be brief. Uh, my sense is that, you know, everyone on the call like this already agrees that, you know, the existing rules don't work very well for countries in the global south and also that the existing institutions are in quite fundamental ways biased against the interests of uh, countries in the global south. And so I want to make just two broad points sort of coming out of research from the International Center for Tax and Development about what that perhaps means for ways forward. I mean, the first is sort of structural. And I mean, there's an obvious interest here in the idea that if we could get better, more inclusive, more neutral institutions, we would get better outcomes. Um, and I think that is an important discussion. But I guess I also want to sort of maybe uh, sound a note of a bit of skepticism about assuming that just because we get more inclusive institutions will get better outcomes, right? Because I think at root, these global negotiations are, you know, it's, it's global power politics, right? Uh, and ultimately, I think to some extent, Logan has sort of hit the, hit the nail on the head about what that really demands, which is it demands that political leaders from countries in the global south, you know, become more proactively engaged in these discussions and sort of making demands on these institutions. Uh, I think as, as Logan pointed out, you know, they, 
it is often tax administrations who are, re who are represented in these forums. Um, but real political change, I think, also demands that sort of more forceful political engagement. And so while it's useful to talk about uh, sort of institutional reform and institutional change, I do think we have to keep this sort of firm focus on, you know, where political action is going to come from. And I think that has to equally come from sort of mobilizing political voices uh, more forcefully. And I think, you know, ATAF is a great example of an organization that's been trying to increasingly do that. Um, because institutional change on its own seems unlikely to be enough, though it might be certainly part of the story. Um, the second thing is just about, you know, in terms of sort of the issue focus, uh, keeping our eyes on sort of what the big questions are. I think looking at research, uh, there are two things that really jump out at me. One is the question of how to sort of allocate taxing rights. And I think a lot of people have spoken to that and it remains very fundamental. The second thing that I think has been mentioned last, but which really is central to the research we've done is the idea that any system that's gonna really work well for countries in the global south and particularly for lower income countries needs to focus on simplification and administrability for lower income countries uh, with less well capacitated administrations. Because if we come up with a system that's inclusive, but too complicated to administer in low-income countries, we haven't achieved our goals. Uh, and so focusing in on that particular question alongside questions of how we allocate taxing rights seems really critical to keep in mind so we don't get in a situation where we're so sort of, so deeply into the details that we lose sight of what's actually happening in individual countries in terms of their ability uh, to, Im to administer these rules and secure the tax revenues that they should. Uh, so let me stop there, thanks very much. Thank you, Wilson. Um, and so I, as I said, I'm gonna try and keep it gender balanced. Uh, we have a lot of uh, men who've ta requested the floor. So if more women would like to request the floor, please do indicate. Um, so I have uh, first on my list, uh, Bruce or Rose. Uh, Rose, if you can keep it very brief um, and maybe just a couple key points and then you can send that some input in later. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Rose Saubrink. I work for Womankind Worldwide, uh, but I'm sharing some points on behalf of the Global Alliance uh, of Tax Justice, Tax and Gender Working Group. Um, so one of the key points that I want to raise is around the gendered impacts of uh, the current uh, international tax system and, and some of the discrepancies that have been pointed out by others. And to really also highlight that um, we won't achieve the sustainable development goals and realize human rights more broadly if we don't look at the gendered impacts of this current system. Uh, and it's, it's currently just really not fit for purpose um, with unacceptable power disparities, as already pointed out, not just between countries um, in uh, the global north and the global south, but also between men and women, uh, with many regressive taxes are actually very sexist taxes. And so the failure to mobilize maximum available domestic resources have continually put gender, substantive gender equality and the well-being of women and girls at risk. And so uh, one of our, our asks is uh, for the panel to build on the momentum of international commitments, uh, such as the uh, International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which also asks for uh, princi principles of progressive realization, non-retrogression, and equality and non-discrimination, as well as participation, transparency, and accountability. Um, as, and the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which we are currently in its 25th um, review and uh, anniversary of, uh, which also calls on uh, including uh, addressing all forms of discrimination, including in tax laws and um, international illicit financial flows. Um, these, uh, CEDAW as well as Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action are not mentioned in the first background uh, paper and uh, we really think that it should be considered in that sense. Uh, and then just really briefly specific gender points. Um, we think it's important to collect sex disaggregated data on the impacts of tax policies uh, and to make sure that there are gender and human rights impact assessment um, but also to make sure that um, women's rights groups in their full diversity are included in meaningful consultation and participation in financial decisions. Um, this, this has been mentioned a little bit in, in some of the consultation in the town hall, but uh, not so much included in some of the more technical conversations, but we believe this is really important. And as a working group, we also support um, the call of the Africa group in G770 and the C Civil Society on FFD Forum um, for a UN tax convention and tax commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so I had uh, Mr. Yo 
Dosina, but I think he may have dropped off the call. If he's still there, can you speak up? No, I think he may have dropped off. Okay, so I had next on my list. Um, Hello. Zach. Oh, you are there. Okay, great. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is Dr. Dosina Yeo, Head of Economic Policy and Research at the African Union Commission. We all agree that the current COVID-19 is causing unprecedented economic and social and monetary damage to the African economy. So tax revenue is dropping as well as saving, national saving, external financing, including FDI, that's for remittances and ODA. So therefore, improving cooperation tax matter become an imperative for our continent. So the AU in its special declaration on illicit financial flow have been making a report and several AU documents and declared decision as point have isolated the main driver of the IFF in Africa, which is which includes commercial company of the IFF. The commercial rule and abuse of practices account for two thirds of Afro in on the continent. So both UN FATI high level panel and OECD task based erosion and profit, shift, uh, profit shifting in inclusive framework and negotiation and also the Global Forum on Tax Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes will have a significant impl um, implication for achieving IFF agenda on the continent. So our joint report with the Global Forum this year shows significant progress have been made on two pillars of the African initiative. That includes raising political awareness and commitment in, in Africa, and also developing capacity in African countries in tax transparency and exchange of information. So the work of the party present for us on the continent as an opportunity, a great opportunity to strengthen international cooperation, respond on illicit financial flow on the continent. So the AU welcomed the endeavor of the pres UN President of General Assembly and the continent, the AU will, is currently working with for the high level panel panel chaired by President Tabon Beki and CODA to mobilize a broader consortium of institutional institution and individual for the anti IFF agenda. And it will therefore foster a, a collective coordinated engagement by the AU member state and AU commission as well as AU organ. Finally, I would like to really insist on the issue of data because the data is not quite easy in Africa. And we need to really work and make sure that we, re we collect the reliable data and trade data on Africa and IFF. The issue raised on inclusiveness also is very important for global tax governance. So we think that I think that we need to also to, we need to put more emphasis on the inclusiveness and participatory framework. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next on my list, uh, because I'm going in a gender balanced manner, we're going to have Sakshi Rai. Sakshi. Thanks, Peter and um, everyone. I work with the Center for Budget and Governance Accountability, and I'm speaking also on behalf of the IFF Working Group under the Financial Transparency Coalition. Um, I'll keep it very, very short. Um, the current international architecture, and by that I mean any of the governance bodies, resolution mechanisms, international tax policies and practices are not aligned with the SDG agenda or any of the human rights principles, which are the objectives of a tax system. Um, their inconsistency is with the principles of representation, non-discrimination, transparency, accountability, among other human rights principles, which makes the avenues of abuse uh, larger. There is no way that this can be continued to be overseen. And I would add, um, just in the end, that we would also be providing evidence of this in greater detail in our just submission to the faculty panel. So thank you so much. Thank you. Admirably brief. We very much appreciate that. Um, so uh, we've got three more that I will give the floor to and then hand back to the co-chairs. Uh, so I have Mr. Zach Puga, uh, Sol Picciotto, and Mr. Jeffrey Owens, I believe it is, uh, from, the third, from the third name. So uh, Mr. Puga, it's for you now. Do you, have, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Peter. And thank you, dear panelists. Um, my name is Zach Puga, indeed. I'm a tax lawyer uh, in New York. 
um, I'm also affiliated with the International Senior Lawyers Project. Um, and maybe I will start there. I shall make three quick points. I'll try to be just as, as brief as others have been. Um, maybe I'll start by saying, uh, making a wish for more of the private sector in these discussions. Uh, this is probably a wish that is usually made, but I'm just going to reiterate it here because um, sometimes it is seen as um, the enemy, but I can assure you, if anything, um, people from the private sector would usually um, bring a view that can be that can be surprising and if anything you can learn uh, from where uh, people in private sectors are at in coming up with policies in terms of um, attacking or counteracting uh, what they are doing and um, so a wish to start to get more private sector input um, because what we usually notice is we come up with this proposal pro policy proposals and uh, they are a step behind two step behind three step behind uh where the private sector is and what companies are doing so uh, trying to get in touch with and getting input from companies if anything will allow you to understand what is going on in the private sector in order for you to respond more accurately now on a more uh, substantive point um international cooperation the point was made uh by kim i believe and i just want to re-emphasize that um the fact that we are aiming for international cooperation will only be possible if the solution is arrived at from an international perspective which means uh, bringing not only these developing countries at the table uh, as ornaments but actually trying to take into consideration their input because many people have said uh, the issues that they face and the issues that they have to deal with are usually very different than the issues uh, that the North um, develop, developed countries have to deal with. So international cooperation, if it can arrive at one of the situations will be, it will be most effective it is, if it is arrived at in terms of applying a solution that has come to, um, that has come into internationally by bringing the developing countries on the table and giving them, I, I understand Kim was offering, for example, a very solid vote, vote per country, not vote uh, depending on the power of the country, that would be, that would be something that would be extremely important if at all achievable um, and again piggybacking on what logan logan said i mean sitting at that uh, at those tables is one thing but making sure that you go there prepared and being able to push and uh, give concrete proposals would be would be a lot more beneficial to the developing countries in getting getting better outcomes and then the other point I will make very quickly is uh, in thinking about proactive good uh, tax policy, I just want to encourage the panel to be bold, um, to be a lot, bold, a lot more bold because we know and we understand that the transfer pricing, arms length standard are usually not working not only for the developing countries but also for the developed world that just do not work and we just have not seen that boldness from policy makers or policy proposal in trying to actually think outside of the arm's length and outside of the uh, traditional uh, transfer pricing transfer pricing constructs so i just want to encourage the panel to try to be bold in coming up with solutions for um uh, this international system, international tax proposals or tax proposals for countries in thinking really bold and outside of the traditional arms and standard that we all know doesn't work but we continue to push forward with. And then I will end okay. by, again, this is a very transactional, uh, it's at, at, at the crossroads of a lot of different things, this, this uh, tax work. We'll have to somehow address um, issues of corruption, we'll have to somehow address issues of governance and we'll have to somehow address, we talk, we were, I was at a different point where we are talking about uh, collecting uh, uh, assets that have been acquired through cost, uh, corruption and bringing it back to countries, we really have to face what that means and because if we are not addressing other issues that go with this international tax policy to make it more effective because we are trying to get to a point where these developing countries and countries around the world are able to raise hopefully more funds but then the question is how do you handle those funds what do you do with these funds so we have to address these issues and i know this is probably a tax specific session but i understand that it's also the crossroads in terms of how being obligated to address these other issues and if anything the virus has only showed us 
that it is extremely important to be able to have these tax revenues in order to react to situations like what we are dealing with right now around the world, where developed countries have been able more or less to respond with really robust kind of uh, policies, general financial policies in terms of giving stimuluses and su uh, supporting their, their enterprises and countries in Africa, which I'm very, very familiar, I know about to respond the same way because tax revenues remain a critical point. So I know, Peter, you're getting thank, a little bit impatient. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I will be forwarding uh, written uh, remarks as well to the panel uh, because these are issues. I live in the U.S., I work in the U.S., but I do uh, keep uh, developing countries in mind very much. Now, before I get very, very number of papers that I've been able to write in these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have, um, uh, next I have Amanda Sol Picciotto. Uh, Sol, can you please be very brief? Yes, thank you, Peter. I'll try to be brief. Uh, um, in any case, I will be taking up your uh, suggestion of submitting uh, a slightly longer paper, but I just wanted to pick up a couple of very good points that I think Irene Avonji made. In this current session, uh, she asked about coherence, um, and uh, I think that's very important. It's quite very important to understand what links tax, corruption, and money laundering. Um, and I think the answer to that um, is also a point that she asked in the last session, uh, which is, uh, to explain the concept of offshore. Um, essentially, um, I think these issues are linked because illicit financial flows take advantage of the offshore system. And to understand the offshore system, you have to understand it's not a particular place. It's a way of avoiding national regulation uh, or evading national regulation. And that regulation could be tax uh, or it could be uh, uh, criminal laws, uh, and uh, corruption laws uh, because national laws are generally based on either uh, the place where activities take place or the residence. Now what offshore does is to route transactions through a third jurisdiction. So that I think is the main link between these three issues. The second link and the second point I want to make uh, is that that's also why uh, these issues concern both avoidance and evasion because they operate in the gray area of things that are not necessarily clearly either criminal uh, or otherwise unlawful um, because of this difficulty of defining the scope of national jurisdiction. So the second point is that avoidance and evasion uh, are linked. It's often very difficult to identify whether a particular activity is clearly criminal uh, also whether it is actually outside the law. So the notion uh, that activities that are not clearly within the law are legal uh, is mistaken. Uh, a good example of that uh, is the recent uh, uh, COMEX uh, dividend uh, issue, uh, which has cost European countries, uh, it's estimated 60 billion euros, uh, 30 billion alone for Germany. And there it's taken tax authorities a number of years even to get to the point of prosecuting anyone. And so avoidance and evasion are linked and tax is linked to corruption and money laundering. Now the third point I want to pick up on is this issue of uh, the so-called digital economy. The important point there is that it's, uh, what the OECD studies in my view correctly have shown is that it's not a separate sector of the economy. Digitalization has made the problems of international tax avoidance uh, much more acute. It's much easier to take advantage of offshore by fragmenting structures and routing transactions to low tax jurisdictions um, because of digitalization. So what the uh, digitalization work at the OECD now very importantly is trying to address is really uh, remedying international tax rules. And there I agree with the comments from, from Zach, who just made the comment about looking beyond the arm's length principle from Annette in her earlier comments, that it is important to look more broadly and really uh, 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 leave behind this arm's length principle, which is a central flaw in the current rules on uh, taxing multinational corporations. But as Thank I say, you. I will be explaining this in a bit more detail in the written submission to the panel. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor. And then I have on my list next Jeffrey Owens. Mr. Oh, Owens. Hi, Peter. Thanks for, for uh, giving me the floor. Uh, I want to pick up a point that uh, my good friend Kim made at the beginning of this conversation on the importance of access to information to counter illicit financial flows. I mean, what we need to be sure of is that we can identify who are the physical owners of the trusts, the LMMs, the shell companies offshore, who actually controls them. Um, and if you look at the standards that are set by the FATF, they're not bad. The problem is implementation, yeah? Weak implementation, both in developed countries and developing countries. We have to ask why that is the case. A lack of resources, poor coverage, old technologies. A lot of these registers, in fact, are manual registers. They're not digital. How do we move forward? I think there has to be a political commitment, in fact, to give these uh, national registries the resources that they need to have up-to-date information that's verifiable. There have to be stiff penalties for non-compliance. I think we need to look at how we can use technologies to improve them at the national level. Let's begin at the national level, and then we can talk about the global level. Yeah? And looking at technologies like AI and blockchain, enormous potential, in fact, that both these technologies have to improve the effectiveness. And if you get effective registered at the national level, then you can use the same technology to link them up at the international level. Um, we're doing quite a lot of work of that in Vienna at the moment. We're very happy to submit um, uh, proposals. But I do think this is the time, yeah? This is a problem that's been around for more than 50 years. Everybody knows what they need to do. What's lacking is the political will. Maybe with the COVID-19 crisis, that will change political attitudes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey. So that brings, I, have, I had one more on my list actually, which I neglected to mention before, but was on my uh, speaking list who hasn't taken the floor yet. And then I'm gonna hand it back to the co-chairs, but I'm gonna ask him to be very brief uh, because we're already half hour over and that's um, Butch Montez, Butch. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, panel. Uh, hello, Jeffrey. Uh, I'm Butch Montes. I used to be the, during my time in DESA, I was the, uh, the secretary of the UN Tax Committee. And actually my main comment is this, that uh, if you look at the, the background note, the first background note from the secretariat that was circulated, that, you know, the one I have, starting from page 34, you will see all the list of venues where these tax standards are being set. And, and uh, a lot of them actually say that it's only in the OECD and not in the UN, right? And my own experience here is that in the Doha Financing for Development uh, Conference, the, the developed countries had actually managed to, uh, to, to sort of study why the UN tax committee should be raised on intergovernmental level. But it uh, ended in the UN. It's, this effort stopped in the UN because of the the question of what the UN calls the program budgetary uh, implications, right? There was no budget for it. Uh, so one, one question that in effect, one of the, the most, imp one, one of the important things that needs to be decided, if you look from page 34 on about all of these venues, is uh, a request to the panel to please look into why it is that the UN cannot do this, uh, cannot be the venue for these negotiations. There's a whole list of, the, of, this, of these venues in which the UN is not the venue for the negotiations. What are the, the constraints? For example, one was brought up that the, there is no guarantee that the, if you have a, a larger governance issue, larger governance that it's not necessarily a, uh, uh, a better uh, decision-making process. But the, you know, the UN has actually done a lot of things. Like it, it, it sets the standards for national income accounting, for example. There are ways to set up a UN process which can, which can incorporate the technical issues and, and come to decisions that are more uh, representative and more transparent and more sustainable. And again, just to, just to end by saying very quickly, these are very important for us developing countries because uh, they end up, the other venues set up standards which then become the source of uh, conditionalities on our policies and uh, uh, and, and and sanctions on, on the part of uh, of the e European Union, as was given by example by by Logan Ward. Thank you. Thank, 
Thank you, Butch. So um, I had, uh, that, that's all I was going to call on today. I had uh, one or two more, but um, in the interest of both gender balance and keeping the time and the fact that some of these speakers have spoken on other consultations, I think we should end it there, co-chairs, and I'm going to hand the floor back to you. Okay, so I understood that now it's my time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for all the participants for your time and for very interesting uh, views and uh, thoughts, especially unconventional, some of them. And that uh, will be a stimulus to us uh, uh, because uh, everything what is already done and discussed uh, in high uh, level G20 and whenever OCD or anywhere else, uh, we know, but uh, this uh, from the roots uh, thoughts, what we are listening during our consultations are utmost important for us and very inspiring. So I would like to uh, try to group the discussion we had today as much as I can and, and, then, uh, and then we will try to work on, on your proposals. So I understood that uh, I can group at least in seven groups, large groups, uh, the ideas we got today from you. And it is uh, first governance and inclusion in decision making is a critical concern for most of us that influences the focus of intergovernmental inter discussion, uh, the type of rules, fairness, the relevance of rules to developing countries especially, and possible sanctions based on that, on these rules. Second is transparency on global tax governance is very important for all of us. Uh, this includes data sharing with all different types of country authorities, as well as researchers and other stakeholders. Uh, third concern is uh, about mandatory binding arbitration. Uh, fourth, we need to think about incentives and sanctions in peer review and for non-compliance, including in, develop, in developed countries. Uh, fifth, there is a need to look at tax incentives and their transparency, especially in after COVID-19 uh, situation, and also especially in developed countries, uh, which have resources to uh, have larger stimulus packages, packages than other countries in the world, while these packages I want to mention usually also are a resource of these packages is increasing debt. So really it's not financial resources that even developed countries have. So and uh, the sixth, uh, we need uh, uh, to see better linkages on sustainability and links to environment and, and social issues. And the seventh, the last one I would like, uh, which may be not the last by importance, uh, but it's already coming up, uh, it was in the second hour consultation with NGOs and now coming up in this consultation about the gender issues in uh, taxation and human rights and non-discrimination uh, taxation systems. So I would like to emphasize also this because in our very first papers, we do not include the gender uh, questions uh, at all. So uh, that's more or less how I try to uh, group and um, we will prepare a full uh, meeting summary and we will publish it on FACTA website in due course. So I would like uh, to ask you to stay with us, to engage with the panel, to help us, uh, to, to watch us and to help to be more efficient and resultative and uh, to enable us to have good uh, and useful uh, outcome of our all work together. So, and I wish you all uh, health, stay healthy, stay strong, stay patient and everything will be fine. Thank you.